Hey everyone, welcome to the 247th episode of Just Shoot It, a podcast about filmmaking, screenwriting, and directing. This episode is brought to you by four patrons that I'm going to mention because they have all been waiting very long for their hats that we just got. These are awesome patrons at the $10 level, Isaac Briding, Emilio Torres, Kevin Schumacher, and Brian Hunter Allen. Thank you so much to you all. We are so sorry the hats have taken a while. We just got a new shipment. We wanted to get them perfect. Let me say they do look, they look fresh. They look good. Very, very tiny update, but I think they're our best looking hats yet. Yeah, I think we, we made some things a little more subtle, some things a little more prominent, and we kind of tweaked the font in in subtle ways that you probably wouldn't be able to tell, but we can tell, and we we love them. So I'm sorry, I think it was worth the wait. Your hats are on their way. So thanks again to you, patrons. I'm Oren Kaplan. And I'm Matt Enlow. Today we've got Kasim Basir on the show. He's here to talk to us about his entire career, but uh, he started early on as a young kid in Michigan, hustling, making awesome movies, really a, a, the epitome of just shooting it. He just shot it every single step of the way. He goes to New York. He comes out here to LA. And we really, we go through the ups and downs. You know, he was a festival darling. He has a movie. He had a movie at Sundance. And now he's like in the big leagues, really pitching on some exciting stuff. But, you know, at the same time, the thing that this show teaches us over and over and over again is that as you elevate the risk and the reward become even greater and so he gives us a lot of really thoughtful time to dig in on his entire journey and i think it's one of my favorite episodes in recent memory i'm really stoked on this one yeah kasim basir is like a textbook version of how to and we never even talked about like finding your voice but i think it about how someone gives of themselves in making a movie and i don't mean that in like a pretentious artsy way i just mean he observed things in his life and he was like, oh, I want to talk about this feeling and tell a story about this. Uh, his first movie, Muslim, is about a Muslim boy that lives during lives through September 11th, the attacks and how that affects his life. And and it's a, it's a coming of age story, both before and after. Right. He's already trying, trying to figure himself out. And then 9-11 happens and how that kind of shapes and forms the, his character's experience, I think, is really exciting. Yeah, I love that. And I love his entire journey and how long and how much of a struggle it was to get to where he is right now. I think Matt and I both love hearing the struggles. We find them almost more interesting than the successes because having, I think, both ourselves and as filmmakers, we know what it's like to be like super pumped about like, a, you know, making something that everyone is super pumped about and then just like not knowing what's next and what to do next. And Kasim has those ups and downs that are really great. I'm going to modify the the thought a little bit, actually. I feel like it's not just struggle that we're excited about. It's the stair step. I think it's like like whenever you, you climb up and you have that success and then, you know, you kind of get knocked down a little bit, but then you continue to climb up. Because I think it is important, you know, part of the show is about illustrating what it takes to be a successful director and what a career looks like and what that trajectory looks like and so if it's all struggle that's no good right but you gotta like see those incremental steps upwards even when they're laced with failure i think is really exciting and so you know kasim is like i said he's really generous with his time and we have a long conversation with him about all of the intricate little steps in between. And I think there's, it's just filled with nuggets throughout the whole thing. But like I said, he's the epitome of just shooting it, starting from not knowing how to make a movie and making one with his friends, but then f- four-walling it and you know selling tickets, setting up a premiere, all the way up to Sundance, all the way up to studio movies. Um, so it's, um, it's really great. Yeah. Really fun. And I want to throw a shout out to our buddy, Stefan Dezel, who's been on the podcast before for introducing us to Kasim as well. So thanks, Steph. Before we talk to Kasim, I want to remind people we have a Patreon page. It's patreon.com slash just shoot it pod. It is a place where if you feel like you get anything out of this podcast, which I feel like a lot of people do, you know, Jordan Brady, another podcaster is just tweeting all over the place about how much he's enjoying listening to us. Uh, Seth Worley, another past guest, also is constantly texting me. All these professionals, they're saying like the stuff you're talking about is really uh, making me rethink my career. <laughs> So if you're one of those people, I'm not saying that you guys, I mean, Jordan has, has been a patron in the past and Seth has, has uh, helped us out in many ways as well. 
But uh, you do feel like you get something out of the podcast and you want to just encourage us to keep going and to help us pay our editors, help pay for our podcast hosting and all those various things, go to patreon.com slash just shoot it pod. You can give us a dollar, five bucks, four bucks, 10 bucks. If you do the $10 level, even for just one month, we will send you one of these brand new, awesome, just shoot it podcast hats. It's worth reiterating at the $20 level, even just for one month, you get yourself a t-shirt. Oh yeah. And the t-shirt. So there you go. Hats, t-shirts. Yeah. Okay. So thanks again. And now we are going to talk to Kasim Basir. Yeah. I think there's no such thing as like a truly happy filmmaker. Or else they <laughs> would, uh... I, I disagree with that, but maybe we shouldn't put so much of our self-worth into our work. Exactly. That's, that's and, the balance, and that's, right? that's what I've been working on, man. Just, yeah. I, I think one of my biggest goals in life is to try to figure out a way to stay here, you know, and not, and not do all this. Like this yeah. I think stays, it's called stays. drugs. <laughs> um, and for those who are can't see what i just did i did a straight line or instead of a you know sure, kind like of a line curve up yeah, and down because yeah. i've this this business has really thrown me around, around psychologically mentally just in the way i feel about myself in the way i feel about how, how far i've gone in life you know just nothing and no one should have that much control over over you and, and i've i've managed to to succeed at it a, a bit a lot more especially than when i first started because when i first started it was it was really something well what i find interesting about you i read your bio and you have a degree in criminal justice and you're pre-law right or yeah sorry. yeah that was i've had a go with like i've had a pretty extreme history with police aggression and harassment, right? Like I, I grew up when I first got my license and pulled over the first day, like car search, you know, I, I had the a gun first, literally the first day. Yeah. The first day yeah. I saved yeah. up a thousand dollars when I was 16 and, and bought a, a car and 15 minutes in the first drive, I'm, you know, the cop didn't believe it. I'm like, I'm just, he's like, where he didn't say anything when he walked up. He's just like, where, where are you going? I'm like, what? Yeah, my He's friend's like, house. <laughs> when, Who man? says He's got that? An he doesn't N64. say like, oh, you were going to play some smash. Yeah. Right. He's like, where are you going? I'm like, I'm just driving around. I just bought this car. You know, He's like, you bought this car. I'm like, yeah. So then fast forward, I'm on the hood while they're searching the car. Hands on the hood. So like, this is one of several stories I have like this. And so out of high school I, I i'm in college i'm like well i want to defend people like me because when i started to learn all this stuff in college about oh you don't have to get out of the car when they ask you if they're for if if you have if they see a, a weapon or drugs or whatever then you have to but if, the cop will ask you like can you step out of the car please you can say no <laughs> you know how, that blew my mind i'm like you know how much how much this could help people knew this, you know? And so I'm like, well, I'll become a lawyer and I'll, I'll help kids like me, you know, because it's, it's, it's a long history that, that really is, is so troubling. I don't even know where to begin. And so I, you know, I took that track. I was in the law, law group, vice president of the law, the law group in, in school. And I, I interned at law firms, you know, and, and one summer I flew through the window of a car and that changed my whole life. And I, and, and in the car, it actually in the car, I had the books for my LSAT that burned, you know, which was kind of a metaphor. Wait, did your car <laughs> explode? Wait, so yeah. Yeah. Were you they in... caught on fire? Yeah. Yeah. Um, after it flipped a couple of times, I was already out of it by then. I flew through the window out into the woods somewhere. So, you know, Right, so you you literally you wake up in the woods and like your car is on fire and the I didn't the, wake the... up until the hospital. Oh, okay. I, I was, that makes, I was that makes more sense. Yeah, yeah. That's not the not the movie version of of that experience. <laughs> I suppose. Right. Yeah. No, this stuff is yeah. not glamorous. Yeah, yeah. It's not pretty. Yeah. That sh- it's yeah, it's yeah. brutal, man. It's just they cut your clothes off you and there's blood and scars everywhere and you're just. But you know, it's ultimately it ended up being free freeing. You know, I. I I was fortunate enough to face mortality when I was young, when I was 22, you know, and I, that was a gift in retrospect because most people face that when they're old and you're like, oh man, I should have done this. Well, for me, I'm like, well, I should do this, you know, instead of 
instead of this route, I want to do something I love doing. And I had been making films, this little high school films and stuff like that and shot some stuff through college, but I didn't take it seriously. And, but after that, I was like, well, you know, I could actually have more of an impact in the world if I make some movies about things, you know things that that matter to me that's interesting and that so did that lead to your first your first feature was muslim right yeah so no i mean i took some time so i i was graduating with that degree so i was just like all right well let me just start shooting so i started shooting stuff around detroit and i made a little local film and i sold it in the liquor stores you know i I would go to the liquor store and detroit these liquor stores have these two inch thick glass on, on them and Behind it, all these trinkets, you have these fake like necklaces and fake gold crosses and you have, you know, Detroit Lions hat, whatever. And then there's my film sitting there and, and I, I would go there every week and be like, hey, you know, try to sell these 10 bucks. You know, you keep five, I keep five if anybody buys them. You like tell a them a local film? guy made it. It was like 60 minutes. So I think it's almost a feature, you know. Right, like on DVD. But it was a real story. It was like me and my brother, my cousin, and some other friends. You know, it's a DVD, yeah. And um, and I was on the cover, like, <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> I started in an act. You're like, was ridiculous. Is that guy? Did he, did I even he wrote on it. The, the must-see film of the year. I'm like, who the hell said it was must-see? Who said that? Because I, I said that. You know, I, it's so charming. You hear those stories, though, of, like, you know, the kid who, like, made his own comic book and, like, talked to the shopkeeper or, like, just the different ways. I, I think it is a real sign of, like, that spark of ingenuity that it takes to keep going in this business. Do you know what I mean? Like, you're you're figuring out how to, like, make a movie and get it in front of people in a unique way and that like obviously like that probably doesn't end up happening you know further in your career you're not worried about how to get in you know distribution quite as much now but like that problem solving yeah you know yes and this is all pre youtube right yes it was it was it was youtube was there which it just was not anywhere near what it so then i made some money and i had a job and i I, then I, i made another film and i was like well this time i wanted to and the quality is a little better and start reading books about it and actually had a casting and all that. And so did you, were you just self-taught? Like, were you? Yeah. Yeah. I just, I just was out doing it. And uh, well, and what's, what's the so paint the picture of what the Detroit film scene is like. There was, there time. was no scene. Nothing this yet. was before yeah. the incentive came there. Okay. Got gotcha. There was not a scene. It was gotcha. like, you know, me and me and like 20 other people who were like, yeah, let's, you know, we can do this. But it is, are you shooting DSLRs, camcorders? What's what kind of? Yeah, like it was, it was the DSLR phase. Yeah. 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 Um, so like that sweet spot. So we're, we're kind of all around the same generation of like, you know, you're on yeah. that cusp, right? Right, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Cool. So then, so with this one, I was like, all right, let me go to the, th- I went to the theater one day to watch another movie and I was like, I was like, hey, guys, uh, can I speak to the manager? And I'm like, how much does it cost to rent this theater? And he's like, it's $1,000. I'm like, all right. So then I do the math. I'm like, all right, it's 300 seats in here, $20 a piece, that's $6,000. I just need to get 1000 You know, if I could fill this up. So I edited the movie, and I did. And I filled it up. I just walked around campus like, hey, look, I'm just preparing a movie I made. People were like, what? <laughs> And everyone yeah. I knew. Don't you I mean, want to come to a, a premiere of a movie? Like, yeah. That's cool, right? Yeah. A premiere of a movie, you could dress up. You know, I'll be there 20 bucks. That's a decent price, you know? And so I just filled it up. I made $6,000. I paid back the theater. And, and then I filled it up again. The and you're week. like writing and editing and kind of and producing I'm doing and every, doing the every whole thing, single right? thing. And I had some people, people with me. And, you know, it's helping out for sure. We had a little crew, very small. So then it was, it was becoming like sort of a glass ceiling kind of situation. And I, and I had Did you have like visiting. a day job and stuff? Like how are you? Yeah, I was in, I worked in post. I was working at a post house. Okay. So you're learning all that. Yeah. Stuff. I'm learning this side of it for sure. And I, I was, Maybe borrowing some yeah. resources to, you know. Yeah, like, for sure. Yeah, I edited yeah. my movie there. You know, they, they cut a lot of commercials out there because of Motor City and all that. So it was, it was good. It was good to have that, that job. And yeah, eventually yeah, I lost there's that There's still job ads in Detroit was, too, right? There's still like a there's still like a decent ad market in Detroit, yeah for sure oh, yeah. for sure yeah. between Detroit and Chicago absolutely that's how anyone in film works 
there. And then you were like, I got to make a real, the real movie next. Yeah. So I was, well, I, and, and I'm like, I kind of want to go somewhere where, and I started visiting New York. I think I was dating someone there and, and my sister lived there. And so I, I was like, maybe I'll move to New York, but it was wildly expensive and I couldn't find a job. But then I lost my job because I was so committed to the film thing, the editing job. They were like, look, man, you like, know, we've supported you. Supported you. <laughs> well, they were bought out by a bigger company. Oh, okay. And the guy who originally hired me had a smaller shop. But the bigger company was like, eh, yeah, like all that they're, film they're shit, not man. patrons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> you know, I do want to interject here real quick, though, because I think a lot of people have this, this similar experience where they, you know, they have a day job, they're making money or whatever, you know, to survive, to pay f- for their films and stuff. They go and they make a film. They shoot the whole thing, you know, in 17 days or whatever with friends, beg, borrow, steal, whatever. And then they're done shooting and they go back to work while they're in post and they're editing. And I I had this experience on my first feature. I went back, I had like a pretty good job and I went back to work and one of the, my boss at work was actually one of the investors in my film. And we had this conversation where I was like kind of half in the job and half like worried about posts and submitting to festivals and all that stuff. And he was like, you know, I've seen this. He told me, give me this advice. Like I've seen this so many times where people kill themselves for production on their feature but then in post which is like the most important part actually of a feature they're just like kind of phoning it in because they're trying to make money they're halfway they're going to vacations they're doing all these other things and they don't you don't sometimes you forget that like the edit is literally the last time you touch the movie before you show it to people and how important it is and he was like you went 90 percent the way there in this last 10 percent you're just kind of like juggling all these different jobs and you're not i mean why that's the difference you, between an a and a b yeah why you know are people I mean, not right? as committed to post as they are to production because it's maybe there's less people it's not as fun it, there's it's more depressing to see your like, girlfriend's this, been this mad at you for is. a month you're trying to make it up to her you know like yeah all that stuff <laughs> so um so i quit my job and i went and like finished the movie which was like one of the, i think the best things i can do but it's kind of kind of like what you're saying i think it's i think you shouldn't be a Remember that post is just like just as important as production. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. It's, you can change an entire movie. When you post. I mean, it could be there are editors that have saved movies that no one knew what to do. They're like movie is shit, is shit. Like you don't. Then some editor was like, "Wait, I know what to do with this." And they, yeah. How many times have you seen like a director's commentary and they're like, "You know those scenes that happen four times in the movie where the characters are in bed talking about this thing and it kind of like makes this whole movie good." Like we shot that a year after we shot the movie because we were having trouble figuring out yeah, what to we, do. Here. We realized we were wrong. So, okay. So then was that when you made Muslim? Right. So I'll, I'm, I'm almost there. So I, <laughs> oh, so I, so I lost that job. My sister, she had lived in this rent control apartment in New York, which was like $500 a month, a month and it was in Times Square. So you, I hope she did so move. She, I hope she's well, still she, there. Well, she, she had to move in to New Jersey. She couldn't live in Times Square anymore. She lived sure, there for three enough. years. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. So I was like... That naked cowboy. I was like, I'll take you. You're naked. You know? well, oh, wait. So you got the $500 apartment in New York? Right. So she yeah. was... And, and it was it was probably three or four months after I lost that job. So I was like, oh, this is, this is, the, this is the sign. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I got to... I got to go and live in, in this place in New York. Um, and I got to chase my career on a bigger level, you know? And so I went and I packed up my car and I drove out there and, and you know, there's a thing about like going to a bigger market where you, you, you just got to swallow all your pride and ego and, you know, no one cared anymore about me at all in New York. It was just like, Oh, you know, everybody in Detroit and you're kind of cool there. And like, yeah, well, that none of that matters here. <laughs> or, or, or even like, oh, I've made a couple features and like we made uh, like, you know, we packed the theaters and stuff. They're like, unless they've heard of the movie, it like doesn't count in a way that's really hard to understand and really hard to to face because you'd spent years, right? Like building a community, making these awesome movies like you were a success. And then to feel discredited can be discouraging for people for sure. But you had all of that skill and that that know-how of how to build a network and make a film that you you right, take right. with you, you know. Yeah. So I mean that was kind of a wake up and it was sobering and it was, you know, no one would hire me for, you know, I couldn't find a job anywhere. I was just trying to find a post job, something I'd known how to do. Um no one would hire me. And so I, then I, my sister she sister was 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 big in my in my transition era because she was modeling and acting she knew all these actors and she knew the community so 
So I started editing people's reels, you know, that kind of thing. And then I entered this short film competition, which Danny Glover was one of the judges of. And I said, I'm going to, and it was specifically about films about Muslim people in America. It was like these shorts, you got to do short. So I ended up entering that competition. I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to win this competition. I'm going to get Danny Glover's attention. And that's exactly what happened. Is Danny Glover a Muslim? No, but he was, oh, okay. he was just a part of the judges, whatever. Okay. So I went, I, I entered this short, which is based on Muslim. And I win my category drama. And I win like five grand or whatever. And you, which, did you make that short in New York or in Michigan? Mm-hmm. Yeah. New York. Hooked up with this producer out there. He loved the, the feature. He ended up producing a feature with me. And he's like, when I was like, we should do this a short, just take some scenes and shoot those. Did it. Wait, so was that that? Um, did you make the short specifically for this competition? Like you had yes. this feature script and you're like. Specifically for this competition. Because it was like, it was like you could win some money. And the coolest thing about it, it was a democratic judging process. It was like people watch them and they vote online. And and that's how you win. <laughs> and and then the, the committee at the end is like, I don't even know what they were doing. I mean, I don't know because they weren't necessarily the judges. The judges were the people. And thousands of people voted. And, and so I won my category. So then they do this whole write up on us in USA Today, which was amazing. And I said, specifically, I'm like, yeah, this is part, part of a feature, you know, that I'm trying to make. And Wait, then, can I, like, can I ask you, uh, sorry, a, qu- a question about that real quick, which is how did you, like, did you try to choose scenes that would play on their own, like as a short, mm-hmm. like, yes, like how did yes. you adapt a feature to a short? I, I just chose some scenes that could kind of give you a, a gist of what the movie was about and leave you wanting more. And you might not completely understand it, but you know there's something going on with these characters and there's some history and there's more. So is there an figure. ending to the short? Like, Not is necessarily. It... It's it's kind of like it ends in, in that, in this state of, okay, I want to, I want to know what's going on with them too. And I want to know why they've been estranged, this brother and sister. And it obviously has something to do with their father, which we saw at some scenes of them when they were kids. You know, it's, it's, it kind of hopefully leaves you wanting to see the feature. But it was, it, it was a bit open-ended. Yeah. Cause I always wonder, I mean, I'm like, I talk about on the podcast all the time about like proofs of concept, shooting proof of concept, like write a feature, take some scenes, make, you know, shoot those to pitch the feature basically. And it's always that question of like, do you need a total, a complete arc for a short film or not? It's interesting that your, your philosophy on it is like, leave them wanting more as opposed to like, give them a closure. Look, it depends on the, the short, you know, I think sometimes you need an arc in this case. It was less of an arc, but but it worked somehow. You know. Well, I think also when you've got like your your actors know the the whole story, like there's a there's a bigger idea behind it, and so sometimes that can inform something and make it a little bit more rich and 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 give people the sense of the depth of and the potential of of a short. You know. Absolutely. So, so then, like I wanted to happen, Danny's company called me, which was which was great. I love that you wanted it to happen and then just... I willed it to be. You willed it to be, but also like it would be easy to be like, hey, you know, find somebody's email and be like, you know, I I saw that you were on the board of this contest and I won. Like you trying to reach out, which isn't a terrible idea, but it's the half of Hollywood is just tricking someone into thinking that it's their idea that you're a great filmmaker. Yeah. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. But also you had to win the competition in sure. order. To yeah. Play. I had to spend, I had to like spend time and shoot a short yeah. and, and have a great screenplay ready. Right. Wait. And did yeah. you have a role for Danny Glover? Well, like, well here's my... where I get into that. I, the screenplay wasn't great at the time. It was, they were like, we want to see it. And this was, this was another moment in my career of like notes you know, which, which is, before I had just written things and shot them, but now it's like, here's one of Danny's executives who's going to give you all these notes, and, and I get the script back and it's read everywhere, and I'm like, I thought this was oh, perfect, this? <laughs> and, and then my ego just jumped out of my body, like, well, who the hell do you think you are? Yeah. You know, and it's like then I really sat down and looked at them, and there was really some good notes in there. Let, let's unpack that a little bit more because I think that is an interesting thing that we haven't talked about on the show a ton. Is that that first time when you feel you're feeling accomplished and you get those notes, and you do you feel maybe defensive, you feel attacked. What um, what did you learn? How did you kind of uh, come to approach taking notes 
back then what would what would you have told yourself back then i guess maybe to the first time you're you're feeling criticism in that way that there are there are valuable opinions out there there are people who've been doing this for a while who know the story that understand what the core of this movie is and what the truth of it is don't deviate from that but be open to hearing things that can make it better we have blind spots all of us and that is just what's true were you in a situation where you didn't know if the movie would be made yet like if you right. did the notes and they liked the the new version then they might make the movie but if you didn't do them then the movie wouldn't be made no they weren't they didn't put me in that position they they made suggestions and ultimately uh, they didn't end up financing the movie i went and found them funding myself oh okay. um but he was in is, the movie right so there came the next stage it was like all right they're interested you know maybe they'll make it some years down the line me being the way i am I'm like well i'm gonna keep trying to get it made you know meanwhile i went and did some obama shorts i had been really inspired by him and there's this investor i had met with a hundred investors maybe you know i'm just anyone i could you know i have a time in my life where i just like oof, like <laughs> everyone that had money is just like you know, I'm, I'm coming to them about a movie. It just... <laughs> How much money were you trying to raise? I was trying to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars. Like, I was trying to raise... Like half a million? Probably close to a million dollars. Okay. And so I knew... Fr I have friends that have made it to the NFL and stuff like that. So I, I you know, I had to talk to them and, you know, and some, right. some people like, stopped, forget stopped that Bugatti. responding to me. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. I have a movie. So then eventually I found a guy who, who said yes. You know. and, oh, so, so 100, and, 100 people said no or, you know, blew me off. And then one guy said yeah. And and they they were the sole investor on the... The sole investor. Uh, cool. And then, awesome. And then he... Uh, and then I came back to Loverture Films with Danny's company. And I was like, hey, well, what if I change this character from a white guy to a black guy? Would you be willing to play, play him, you know? And, um, and, and, and you're like, and I have agreed. the money. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so we're not coming to you for the money. <laughs> right. Did you have to then negotiate his fee? Like Yeah, I mean the, the the producer did, you know. But he he wasn't he wasn't like hitting us over the head. He was a part of the project, you know. He was he wanted to see it succeed. And right. If, well, if I think I it's an interesting any... yeah, and an interesting way to cast. Sorry to interrupt you, but like Matt and I talk about cat. We were t just talked about this a lot about like how casts can make a movie. It's like he was into the movie, and then you came back to him with the money. But it wasn't like you were like making offers, like million dollar offers to like ten different actors to see. Right? Who you can no, meet. not for this one. I mean, we we came. We Evan Ross came on first to star in it, and then um, and then Nia Long was next, oh, and cool. then we had both of them when when I went to Danny. Like, hey. Right, you know, and you had the short and we had seen the, the short. We won the short. We had the funding, so it was like. And you did their notes, which, by the well, way, to me, that's like a good a, amount of them. Yeah. A really, a really good piece of advice is like, if you want somebody to feel like they are a part of a project, ask them for notes and then do their notes. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Or, or to some a part degree, of the however, yeah, 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 yeah. And then you're like, yeah, you, you know, you, my, this project has a piece of you in it. So you know, if you want to be involved. It, well, and also, you know, people talk about the easy yes, right? Like only a crazy person would say no, or or I guess it would be a scheduling problem, or maybe it could be the other reason. But like, they like the project, they're invested in you, right? They like the script. They're, you're, you're not, not asking, asking them, them for money. money. You're offering them a role, and, and you've shown them that you value their creative input. Like what? Who? who and and how many days did Danny Glover shoot? Like three days. Three days. We, we just like yeah, it's like a long it weekend. It was just, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so there you go. Like we we just did all his scenes in three days. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like, you built the schedule this is around. Danny him. weekend. Yeah, don't nobody do nothing yeah. else. Man. <laughs> yeah, no drinking tonight. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was cool because uh, Evan's mom, Diana Ross, showed up. You know, she and she happened to be there. <laughs> I mean, um, that is pretty on, cool. <laughs> on Danny, was weekend. she making like helping with the craft service table? <laughs> oh god, <laughs> no. I was. It was just, but it was a lot of pressure because she was sitting there. You know, we gave her a chair and everything, and she was sitting there, kind of like. I hope you're doing this right, you know, my son. Yeah, that is great. <laughs> Diana Ross is watching you directly. Yeah, I didn't, it was like a surprise visit. <laughs> somebody came on, between setups, somebody, one of the PAs came over like, um, yeah, so I, uh, 
Mrs. Ross would like to talk to you. Oh my God. I'm like, who? <laughs> and they're like, She's yeah. And I'm like, Evan's too. mom? Yeah. You mean Diana? You mean Miss Diana Ross? You mean the queen of... You mean this is... Yeah. What? Yeah. So I go in the trailer and there she is, you know, just radiant. And she's like, so... You know what's going on. We had a great conversation. Yeah, uh, can I see your shot list, please? <laughs> she doesn't know. You're like, I don't really work with shot lists. I kind of like find it yeah. on set. Uh, okay, Evan. Most, mostly, she was just she was just checking me out. You know, she just wanted to see who I was. You know, people like that have this way about like just sort of you know seeing who people are. You look someone in the eyes, and you can just kind of tell. And so. I have like uh, the C minus version of that story. <laughs> I was making this like just dumb comedy short thing with this guy, Evan. It was like a tiny, like a 10 person crew. And he's like, oh, my cousin, my cousin's around. Is it cool if he stops by the set? And I'm like, uh, yeah, I don't, sure, whatever. And then his cousin shows up and it's Adrian Grenier. And this is at the height <laughs> of Entourage. Yeah. Um, and I was like, uh, your cousin? Does he want to be in this? He's like, no. <laughs> no, he's <laughs> just going to come say hi. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, kind of kind of threw me off for the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Worst thing I've ever directed. <laughs> okay, cool. So, uh, so, anyway, so you made this look, movie. Yeah, I made this movie. I, I felt really great about being able to kind of just rise to the challenge. You know, I I just had all these feelings beforehand, but once people showed up, it was like that stuff went away, and I was like able to to move. And was that your first time working with kind of like a list yeah, talent? Yeah. For sure. And what's it's, and that's different, uh, right? It's different working with people like that. Like for, like just from a logistical standpoint, oh, yeah. it's a little every, different. You, you can't gotta, just have them like have go everything. change in the porta potty. Right, right. You got to have everything. You know, if you're bringing someone to town, you got to make sure everything is good from from the moment they show up, from the moment they land. I mean, even where they're flying from. Right. Yeah, I'm not so, an LAX fly, guy. I'm more of a Burbank to, dude. <laughs> right, right. You the, joke. The that's kind of true. From their door yeah. to 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 Detroit to their hotel, like making sure every part of that, and when they're coming to set, just how people know how to treat them. People aren't asking for pictures and all that. Like it's it's a whole thing. So you know that part is 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 really something. I think that it's also worth mentioning that you know, you talk about like the logistics of like, oh, making sure the car is waiting for him or anything like that. It's not that any celebrity necessarily is a diva or that they can't call an Uber if they need to or whatever. It's that if if people haven't taken the steps to line things up correctly, it's an early indicator that maybe this production isn't going to go as smoothly as you right. want it to. Yeah, you, know? you don't want them to have that feeling. Yeah, yeah, exactly. When someone gives of themselves like actors do like there was a scene in muslim where Nia along and she finds something out about her son and her and the father and everyone's in that room and it was hot and it was intense and it was just the most emotional thing i've ever been a part of you know they're they're giving of themselves in a very deep vulnerable way most people n never do that and and unless they are in front of someone they love or in some kind of dramatic you know, angry situation or sad situation. Actors are doing it in front of the camera for the world to see. And um, so 25 to, strangers standing in the room. Right. You know, like. Right. So so if they're going to give that, you know, they need to feel safe. You know, all, all of these things, whether it's the car service or how they're being treated when they get there, give them the ability to feel, to feel safe so that they are able to. So you got to fire that, that creepy screen. boom up. <laughs> Just staring too long. <laughs> um, um, so we made that film and I learned tons. And I and the, the just the log line is it's it's about a being Muslim kind of in post September 11th. Right? Yeah, well, the, well, nine eleven happens to, on in the movie in his you know when he goes to college and it, he's already dealing with having had a very strict upbringing and trying to free. It just kind of trying to understand life. But then 9-11 happens and then the whole transition of how this country viewed and treated Muslim people changed like almost immediately. And wow. did you use any real footage from 9-11? There's a scene when it's happening and everyone's in the student center watching. And there's a newscast that we created. And so there was like 
I'm really interested in this whole idea of, you know, fear is a moneymaker, you know, um, these fear campaigns that people run. And I saw it happen. You know, I, I've, I lived a life being feared for being a black man. And I've, I've watched people act a certain way around me. I walk up and, you know, this, this thing, grab a purse, whatever, it's cross the street. I've seen it all. I was staying at an Airbnb once in, in LA where I met the owners of it the night before. And we had rented the bottom of it. And there was a husband and wife. And, next, and there was this common area where we, we go to eat. And there's You could leave your food or whatever. And I was staying there for like a week. And so I go up there in the morning to the common area. And the woman is there. She turned, this white woman, she turns around and she's like, you know, she screams for like 10 seconds, you know, this, the woman I met last night. So I'm like, but I just knew, I just knew what she was feeling. You know, I've lived a life of this, like, all right, you know, I'm pushing carts at Kroger when I'm 15, you know, 14 or whatever, women locking their doors and like holding their steering wheels. I'm wearing a red sure. vest, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, you're like in the Kroger cap, <laughs> hat, like, yeah. And, yeah. and you're like, you know, like that. And it's, so I know, you know, I know this fear thing. So for me, the idea of like seeing this play out in a film and just coupled with his own emotions of trying to become himself, come, come of age and, and deal with that could be an interesting film. So yeah, it, it's dealt with just a guy just trying to figure out life and then 9-11 happens. So, so that film ended up taking me around the world. I mean, I, I that thing opened and probably 20 countries or something and i went to all these premieres and like i went to the u.s government brought me to italy around between rome and milan and reggio padova to to have screening and discuss like discrimination and stuff like that you know US and this is like 2011 ish right 2010 yes, 2011 11, 12 i think the movie came out at 11 i think that trip was on 12 that's crazy so it at that point, do you like get, did it have distribution? Are you making money? Yes, yes. Are so people the, so, calling reps? Right. How so does, how does so that, that became, that film was the first time I had paid to, to direct and write. So then that was just in the budget. So then I also started speaking at universities, you know, because of the topic. And so that I'd sign with the speaker's agency and I would go and speak at like universities. So you would the screen the movie and then you would... Do you yes, like a yeah, half yeah, hour, yes. hour talk afterwards? Right, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. I would talk about, you know, the topics that it covered and I would have a QA. and a And I mean, I went everywhere from Vassar to, to University of Alabama to, you know, um, uh, UC Riverside to, I mean, I was all over the country, University of Michigan, Michigan State. Meanwhile, between that, I would go and premiere the movie in Sydney or, or Dubai or whatever. And there was companies distribution companies in all these countries that were playing the movie. It was the first of its kind, you know, um, talking about that topic, being a young, young black Muslim dude in America. But what I wasn't doing was in the, I wasn't in LA, like getting an agent mm -hmm. and doing you all that. You weren't doing like, the water which, bottle tour. I wasn't yeah. doing the thing. Yeah. I, you know, I didn't even know you were supposed to do that. You know, it was kind of Right. And a speaking agent is late. so different than like a, like a Hollywood Right. A speaker's agent. agency. Yeah, yeah. Every one of these agencies has speakers, speakers, uh, bureaus within their agency. I I was at a straight up speakers. They would hit me up every other week and be like, "Hey, they want you." At, and it's it's pretty good you know, money, like that. It's, it's funny. Great money. It's it's a thing. It's 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 how I survived between movies. I swear to you, it's, it's it was one of the best things that I mean. It was it was one screening I had where somebody walked up to me like, "Hey, would you like to show this movie yet?" University of Dayton in Ohio, and I'm like, yeah, sure. And he's like, yeah, we'll pay you a couple grand. I'm like, what? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, I already and, made and the movie. Was like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so that was the beginning of it, and it was kind of, you know, and it was, and I loved doing it. I loved like going and having these these discussions with these minds that really didn't, a lot of them didn't know the world and didn't didn't had never heard this perspective, you know, and it was wonderful um going and having these deep like hard conversations and mind you this was 10 years after 9 11 and people were not a lot of people were not happy about screening a movie called muslim and you know just immediately we're 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 cut off from it or or felt a significant anger towards it and it, i'm like listen 
Muslim people were fucking terrified too on 9 11. You know what I mean? People here were like, wait a minute, what's happening? You know, that my sister's friends were going to like harass and attack because they were wearing hijabs, you know? Like that was happening. Somebody tried to hit my sister's friend with a car and she jumped out of the way yelled some obscenities to her out, out the window like and she stayed in the house for two weeks like stuff like that was happening and i would go to places you know and people would say i was at university of, university of alabama uab which is not the official university of alabama but it's university of alabama somebody's an audience like well well which one of you moves i'm just gonna apologize for 9 11. <laughs> like whoa <laughs> I'm like, the movie's called Muslim because of the mis- mispronunciation of the word Muslim, which, and literally stands up in the Q&A and says, well, which one are you Muslims? And so, you know, I'm, 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 like, I'm, I'm fielding questions like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, anyway, so I'm doing all this and, and then I, then I met someone and I was, you know, I'm here, I would, she lived in Paris. So I was going there a lot. So I, so I was, so you, I didn't really you live. You are in, living the life though, right? I was living the life. I mean, I was, yeah. literally I met someone and, you know, the, the film was playing in in Paris. So then I was like, oh, I'm going to Paris next month. I'll see you there. You know, like that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, yeah. The, the company Being was able to, to say Paris that, well, oh, boy, how smooth is that? Yeah. Well, yeah. I say oh, that to so. people. I, I we'll know. Catch up how smooth was that? <laughs> and it's so funny when they show up in Paris and I'm not there. Yeah. So so I, I, I want to ask, though, about how – so you're, you're touring with the movie. Like you found some some tangible success. You're making money, right? You're flying all over the world. But, you know, I think sometimes filmmakers can get seduced by the thing of traveling with your film and going to festivals and uh, in certain circumstances, and promoting not, f- not making a ton of money. Like you, you're like so fortunate to be able to screen your film and also get paid to talk about it. Like that's incredible. But it does. There is an opportunity cost there. So what? Af- For sure. After all of that, what was? Yeah, the so n- I was getting to. Yeah. That. yeah. The, this me, is the yeah. dark side. Oh, okay, there we go. Okay, yeah. <laughs> that was like the, this was like yeah, yeah. the, woo, uh-huh. was like, yeah. <laughs> um, so then you, you realize, cause you don't, no one teaches you this part of like when you have some success and you then, you just have to learn it and you see the happen to people and you're like, yeah, that would never happen. Just, but after those years um, of like 2012 to 14, I'll call those like my dark years where I, I just was, where the wave kind of like crashed. Mind you, I, I would go on like CNN and talk about the movie, stuff like that. When I was on BET, I was in, I would go do an interview with CNN and people would recognize me, you know, it was, it was like that. And so I'm like- Yeah, yeah, that's intoxicating. That's yeah, and I, right, I, yeah. I'd leave that interview live and then I'll have 400 firm requests or like, you know, all these messages and, and then the wave kind of crashed and, and then I started to come out to LA, but it was a little late, you know, for the film and like, it wasn't, I didn't really have the kind of steam and, you know, I was trying to put my second movie together and it fell apart. When you say late, like how long after you made Muslim did? Probably uh, the movie came out at the beginning of 2011. I finally came to LA into 2012 when it okay, was like, so like almost two years. Yeah, almost two years, and 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 you know, so then it and then it was heading into twenty thirteen. So now the movie's two or three years old, rather than last mm-hmm. year. You know, I think about that stuff all the time. Like if you look at your IMDb and your latest credit is like two or three years old, they don't know, know about all the things you almost. They don't made, know about you know? all the things, man. All the things you've been working on. All the so with all that, I was I was doing I was going to these events. I was you know I was also writing my next script. I was but I had not gone to LA, like I said. But what I was also doing was I was drinking a lot. I was, you know, I need my mind to write. I need to be clear, you know? And and there came my sort of crash and I, I got to LA. And so it was just like, yeah, okay, you made this one. Like, and it wasn't as, I don't know, it just didn't seem like anything was gonna happen ever again for me. And And I fell into this really hard kind of place in my life where but for for a while, I just I kept trying to put the movie together. It wasn't working. I had an actor attached. She got a Marvel movie, and this is for your there. next movie. The yeah, movie. for my next movie, Destin. And it was it was hard. I mean, I, I was in retrospect, especially when I'm in it. When you're in it, you still don't realize how 
bad it really was, but in retrospect, it, it got pretty bad for me to a point where I had to just go home at one point. So you, you were in LA just kind of like trying to get producers to look at stuff, reps, things like that. Yeah. Just not yeah. really knowing what the next move was. Well, I wasn't trying to get reps yet. I just was kind of trying to get this next movie made and, and it fell apart twice, you know, and with each time it fell apart, I had to put it, put it back together and convince people that we could still make this. And what were you doing for money at the time? Were you still, I was still do doing speaking schools. And stuff? Um, I was, I was still doing schools, but it was becoming less and less. So the money was, was getting less. I'm seeing it shrink. I'm seeing less and less emails come in. Um, eventually the speaker's agency dropped me. <laughs> I mean, like it was, it was like that, you know? And, I, and then I was like, Oh, okay. And you're like, um, am I destined to make this movie? Yeah. I'm going to change the name of the name <laughs> to answer that question. Right. So then eventually, uh, I, I met, I mean, I'd been working with this other producer who, you know, he was still committed to it, but he also had a film that ended up getting into TIFF, which, which was great. And I started kind of like, you know, it, it would became a little bit about that. And then he ended up getting a studio film. So like he was doing his thing and I didn't know if I was ever going to make the film again. So I, I literally had to go back home in 2014 and, and um, just kind of regroup in a, a, a regroup when you go home you just get this feeling of like it's all right man you know we that's, care about you no matter what that is good la don't I, give a shit about you unless you're doing something <laughs> yeah, man yeah they don't care yeah they don't care yeah that's, at home they're like oh Cosmo, what's up, man? Yeah, yeah yeah that's good you know how was that movie you made a movie dog that's amazing <laughs> they don't care that it was three years ago you know right oh my they're parents like, still talk about my the movie right. like 10 years ago like it's like my crowning achievement right and I needed, I needed that. I needed to get refreshed from home. I needed that. And I, and with that, the story was a Detroit story. And I, I, I actually crafted the script a little bit more to, to reflect what was happening in the city at the time. And so I, I spent almost, almost all of 2014 there. And, and meanwhile, meanwhile, I had gotten support from, so, so one of the turning points was between 13 and 14, the movie had fallen apart a couple of times. I was getting an email from Tribeca Film Institute saying, you've been accepted to the Tribeca Film Institute for, you know, this year's TFI. But you had sent them your, submitted the screenplay or how did you get Yeah, I submitted the screenplay. I had applied before I applied for Muslim. They said, no, I had applied. Mind you, all these stories I'm telling you, the whole time I'm applying the stuff, I'm trying to get grants, I'm, you know, doing all this. Most of the time I said no. But this time they said, yeah, you can come in April. It's a week, the week of Tribeca. You get to all these meetings. You get, we put you in front of people, investors, companies. So that gave me some hope. And I, so I went there with the producer and we, we got in front of, we got some new steam behind the movie, you know? So eventually we ended up getting the financing from several different investors. You know, while I was home, I met an investor. While I was in New York and Tribeca, um, I met the guy who was in the NFL who was like, yeah, random. I, I, I was, at the bar, I start talking to this girl, and he walks up. He's like, "Oh, you met my my girlfriend." I'm like, "Yeah, what's up, man?" You know, um, and and, and he's like, "I'll and, give you one million dollars to walk." Around. <laughs> I will give you one million dollars. <laughs> but um, but he's like, "Yeah, man, you know, I just start playing for the Jet for the Giants." You know, uh, I'm like, "What the New York Giants?" <laughs> he's like, "Yeah, but you know, I know this stuff's temporary. You know, I want to." but I've always been interested in film. I'm like, you know, a good way to get into film is to invest in <laughs> Oh man. Yeah. Wait, and how much were you trying to raise for Destiny? I was trying to raise, we were trying to raise around the same, around 800, 700. And by this point, you know exactly what you can do. With yeah, like I, know, I know what we need. I know what we need. And you have no cast attached at this point, right? Well, yeah, we, we had a couple. We had Corey Hardwick attached. It was this wonderful actor. He's, he's done a lot of action stuff and you know he, this is was his first starring role we had hill, Har hill harper attached um who's also an executive producer on it he had partnered with my the producer uh, on his company at, at that point um so we had a couple couple names attached and um and so i you know even with that investor and, and my producer found the other investors and and so like this guy named rick rosenthal was like this wonderful director and he's just a great guy um, who has a spot here in LA who who's done several movies and he he came on and he was he was probably the most influential investors because the other investors weren't in the film and 
or at least two of them weren't. And when they saw him, a guy that was established, they were right. like, okay, like, oh, okay, guy. he's placing yeah, bets, yeah. right? Like, right. I could place my. Once Rick talked to him, he's like, yeah, look, I'm going to do this. You know, I'm going to come in for whatever. And he's the guy that directed Bad Boys. Yes, yeah, that's Rick. That's Rick. Yeah, the original Bad Boys. Yeah. The, How did you get him? So my producer made that connection, Tommy Oliver. Okay. So that was that was like the, the the crew, and and he gave me a lot of mentorship and a lot of advice, and it just was sort of a home to come to. It was it just became this this kind of support they got that came behind. They still don't understand how much that meant. I mean, I tell them, but how much it meant for me to come through those dark years and for them to step up and and get behind my next film. Wow. Did he give so, you any mentorship in terms of oh, yeah, the, the actual filmmaking part? Absolutely. Like outside All of of the... Every single step from the writing to the shooting to the editing, every step of the way. I, I have a question actually, because it feels like you've, you've managed to find great producers all along the way, right? Like that, and that, like that sort of partnership um, has really been instrumental in terms of your career tra- trajectory how did you find these producers? At film festivals. Every single one of them. That's Boy, that's the film best Film festivals ac- are, are just the best. I mean, so this is an interesting story, and it, and it comes around to Destin. I went to a film festival once called American Black Film Festival in like 2007 or something. Just like the Black Sundance. Everyone goes there, from Spike Lee to Singleton, rest in peace. That's where I met him. To, you know, Denzel's down there. I mean, it's, it's like, it's down in Miami. It's unbelievable. And the first time I went there, it blew my whole mind. It inspired me so much. And I didn't... And you went there without a film. You just went there. I, no, I, my film got denied. The film I made in Detroit, they rented out the theater. They were like, no. <laughs> and so... And but you so, still went without the film. Just I to, still went without it. And I, and I had like information from Muslim. I was like passing everyone these flyers. Like, here's this movie I'm trying to make. Here's my information. Here's a small synopsis. I had an image and everything. People are like, ah, thanks. And I would see the flyer around the ground. Sure. In, in <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like in every garbage can on every corner. <laughs> but honestly, that's like marketing too, you know? Yeah. People yeah. are walking I mean, around and they're was... like, oh, what is this thing? I see it everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And mind you, I, I didn't have any real money then. And I, sure. you know, yeah, these Kinko's is expensive. expensive. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Just, yeah. but just to get a festival pass and all that. So the events I would sneak in. I was literally sneaking into them. And the producer that I worked with on Muslim, she she worked with the festival as well. So like she, her name's her name's Dana, Dana Offenbach. So she would kind of like open the door or whatever. She would look look twice. And I went to the to the award ceremony, which and I was sneaking in the back door with like, you know, the audio people, whatever. And so I was like, and meanwhile, and then they whisk they're whisking a celebrity through, and I'm like, and I look up. And there's Nia Long. Uh, I'm like, oh, hey. And she turned around like, who are you? Kind of. She didn't say that. Sure, sure. But she said it with a look, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh, hey, Nia, me and you can work together one day. you know. And that was my first time <laughs> offering Nia a role. That's too so good. there's, That's there's too more good. relevance. She's like, this. security. <laughs> <laughs> so there's more relevance to this. So we, we end up shooting Dustin in Detroit. And, this, and it came down to the last second with, with the investors because the NFL guy, he ended up starting his season. He's like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to put the money. You know I mean? We had agreement and everything. We hadn't signed it. I don't know. But there was something we were like, hey, man. you know. <laughs> so I'm, I'm watching. You can't make this kind of shit up, man. I'm watching a, a, a game. And... Under the little clicker, it's like, who's injured? And it's him. And I'm like, oh, my. So now he's injured. And, uh, and, you and know, he hasn't like, given you the money yet. Right. And so you think like, okay. <laughs> and now am I going to be an asshole here and just call this guy while he's on the surgery? I mean, sure, this yeah. was not a. Yeah, his this career was a is on the line. Yeah, yeah. Injury. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> this is a, this is a maybe I'll stop playing football injury, which makes me think about all my investments. I'm, I immediately go there and I'm like, okay. Um, so I, I, I called my hand and I heard, you know, yeah, I hope, hope you're okay. Cause I'm genuinely worried about him. I'm like, cause we had developed a report, like a for real report. Cause part of his deal was like, okay, if I'm do this, I want to be able to have access. So we could talk all the time. I want to learn. I'm like, sure, man, whatever. So we would talk, I would send him drafts. He'd, he'd come to pre-production on. So and finally I'm like, you know, he's, 
he was about to go on surgery, you know, maybe the next day or maybe that day. And I, and I had a conversation with him, you know, I, I played football before and I spoke to him like a, like a teammate. And I said, look, we're on the, this is, we're about to go play the game. You know, we're a team. We, I hate to do this right now. I swear to God, I do. I hate to do this right now, but I have to. We've hired people. We've, you know, and he's like, yeah, I get it, man. And he went to the bank that day. And something was happening digi- technically that wasn't working. I was like, put the bank on the phone right now. Because he's like, <laughs> he's like, well, they're saying this yeah. and maybe I'll come back to him. I'm like, put him on the phone right now. And I said, excuse me, sir. I don't know what the hell is going on there, but if he leaves that bank, Without making this investment, he's not investing in this movie. I knew that in my heart. I was like, I don't get whoever you got to get. Your tech guy, I don't care. Anyway, so he they fixed it and, and it happened. So so we made this movie in the coldest winter on record in, Detroit, in Michigan. Because it kept getting pushed back. We were supposed to shoot in like September, then November, then October, then November. So we started shooting in November. You know, it's... It was just snow every day. It was sleet. It were, got company moves. I mean, it was hard and at this point you still don't have any like a manager agent any hollywood no no i still didn't have any yeah i i think that's really i'm glad you bring that up though oren though because i think that so often people think that that can be a limitation you know and like you've got two movies under your belt you've traveled all over the world and you still don't have reps and once you eventually get reps spoiler alert it still doesn't solve all of your problems you know oh no no no, and it's not and like we'll, it's not like you have to stop thinking of ideas and everyone's just sending you shit right, all the time. Right. Which which will lead that will lead perfectly to my next thing. So we make this movie, we Destined. We yeah, we make Destined. The next year we get into LA Film Festival, which was like Right. Really awesome. Dope festival. Awesome. Festival. R. I. P. Like, so the, yeah. yeah, the best. R. I. P. I know. And so we're like, all right, cool. So we we premiere there. We go down to American Black Film Festival, which you know that festival I was talking about, where I didn't have a pass. And then we win Best Director, Best Actor, all these awards. And like, I go up in front of this audience, and I'm like, when I tell you the amount of emotional resonance in that moment, because it wasn't just about the, this award. It was like the years in between. I mean, it was five years between Muslim and Destin, and it was just a lot of success but also a lot of pain and struggle and like i didn't know if i would ever make a movie again and for these people to recognize it and people really appreciated the film and um i got up there and i, I just had a start just cry i just cried while i was speaking. and you know it, we went on to play a bunch of festivals and we got a distributor and you know, it's, it's like the up and down because then the distributor goes bankrupt. And <laughs> sure. Yeah. Like, Which what? is like a 50% chance with an indie film. God, even yeah. higher, I, mean, I feel like. <laughs> it's yeah. it's unreal. I mean, we were... And you're like, does that mean I get my movie back? And they're like, right. not exactly. Yeah. Then we couldn't get in touch with anyone. And then this other company comes in and like takes all the titles. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and in the bankruptcy. To, we just sold right. your movie for six dollars. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So then so D- Destin is in flux and to this day it's just now starting to get to get out on things. So not as many people had heard about that movie other than our festival success and stuff like that. And, right. and that LA Film Festival must be like that's an industry festival, right? Yeah. You, you must yeah, things it, must have happened just from being in that festival, right? Yeah. So that that's when I pr- first got a manager. And so I got, I finally got a manager and, you know, I, the road to like edit Destin and all that, it was a very complex movie. There's, there's one guy, it's, his life splits into, and we go back and forth to each story, trying to make them succinct the whole time. So it was a really interesting and quite difficult edit, but we, we made it happen. It's like kind of sliding doors. Sliding but... doors meets like Pleasant Hood or something. You know? Cool. And so, so that was a whole struggle in itself. And that till this day is just one of the hardest things. Uh, but we're but we're still chugging along with that film. Eventually, we'll try to get it to Netflix and all. So, and I was going to say, like, I think that's the thing when people talk about like in your contracts with distributors when they ask for ten years, fifteen years, or whatever. You know, there's always a part of you that's like, well, that isn't so bad if they're hustling on right. my movie for ten right. years. Like, you know, keep selling right. it in the library or whatever. But because you don't know what's going to happen, right? That's right. why you can't get your movie back right now, right? Like if there were clauses in there that said like if you go bankrupt I get the movie back, but no one wants to sign that. Yeah. Anyway, little word of caution. Yeah, yeah. And and so then then it became this journey of 
of like, all right, let, let's try to get you on some other films, you know? And, and then I started going to the meetings and all that stuff. And now, now I'm in LA officially. I'd moved there in 20, moved here in 2015. And I'm like, but nobody, right, so, but still, I think it's important to note, still nobody is paying you to be in. Right, LA. right, right, right. But I had, I had made, I had gotten paid to make that movie. You know, it was in oh, deal, Destin, you know? right. Yeah. Just because so, you paid yourself, but. Yeah, right. It's like director. But it's not like you're giving yourself right. like. Two hundred fifty thousand right, dollars. Right, right. You're giving right. yourself enough to survive. Yeah. Right. While right. you make the while movie. you're making the movie, right. and then you still have to promote the movie for like a year. Right. You know, right. Whatever that director's fee is, I, I doubt it's like right. you know enough to last. But you know what's interesting too, years. though, we started winning money at uh, oh, film nice. festivals yeah, yeah. we win. Yeah, you that's know? great. That's but crazy. that goes like back to ABFF? your investors, right? Mm, no, that so like ABFF, I won twenty five thousand dollars for best director. Oh, okay. That um, kind of thing. That's, and you, you don't know, give that like, back to the investors? Yeah. No, that was for best. <laughs> That's an award. You don't, <laughs> I mean, you don't give the investors, uh, like, oh, the statue, you know? Like, well, if it was, my movie, you know, we won some a... awards. We got, like, five grand, ten grand here, and we always, we just, I mean, I was one of the investors for my movie, so maybe it's a little different, but uh, <laughs> I wonder, did we? I thought we did, but maybe not. But that's cool. Twenty five. No, but grand, we, um, some of it, the other, there were some other awards that did go back. Some You're of like, it's that, not for best EPs. Back. It's for best director, guys. <laughs> I'm the director. There were, there were some awards that did go back to the whole film, for sure. So I'm in LA. I'm like trying to make stuff and then, you know. I'm, and at this point, are you trying to do commercials or TV or anything other than movies? Well, I was trying to do TV. I had met some people about commercials. It never really happened. I'm still, I'm still trying to get into commercials. <laughs> That's, and so it's, so I'm, I'm, I'm meeting about TV. I'm meeting about, stuff then i get an agent and some agents and it ramps up i'm going to meetings and i'm just i'm just getting no's everywhere you know is like, this like a top um, tier agency like a top five like yeah i mean it was it was apa um apa okay cool. uh, so then i'm getting meetings everywhere and or a lot of tv meetings a lot of and then for other films and stuff but and i'm i'm meeting well i'm doing having good meetings but ultimately people eventually say, say no i got no's everywhere so then i'm like whatever man i know how to make a movie you know let me just let me just let me write something else so i wrote boy girl dream and I, my wife you know it was semi autobiographical was you know talking about the night we met and or the first night we hung out and and also my experience of people kind of putting their careers aside to to make money or get into a certain hustle. I had friends in New York that were club promoters, but you know, they came to New York to, to to make music or movies or whatever. There's so many adjacent businesses where it's like, kind of, you pick up a bunch of skills and you're like, well, this is a thing I could do. I kind of like it. And it's similar. It's in the same world. It's all the same contacts, but then they're not, they're, they're not calling you to do a session. They're calling you to book a session for somebody else. You know, it's funny. Suddenly, I understand the title of the movie, like just by you saying that one sentence. So, so that, so then I, I, that was on the way back from Urban World Film Festival in New York. It was that was actually the first festival I ever played with Muslim. I'm curious. So, Muslim is like kind of a big topic, big movie, kind of socio political. I mean, I know it's a personal story, but it's on the this backdrop of the entire world, pretty much, right? And then Destined is like this almost genre film, right? Like high concept dual storyline thing and then your third movie where ostensibly you would get the biggest budget and the biggest production value you write this as smallest story yet right right Just well i kind of yeah i kind of went backwards in a way you know this was a this was actually the smaller budget from the three and, and why why did you do that because i i wanted to i had to make something and i was like i don't i was hanging out with omari hardwick at at, at ABFF, he was the ambassador of the festival that year. And we had been talking about doing stuff together. And I've known him for years and he's been, he's one of the best people in this business. Just he's in his heart, he's a real, real guy. And I was like, you know, we celebrated my birthday together. And I was just like, we need to do something, you know? And I win, I win best director, you know, because I'm getting a good amount of steam. So then I played a couple more festivals and in New York, I'd seen some of my old friends who were still you know, hanging out and promoting. And I was like, let me, uh, and on the plane ride back, I wrote the whole out. Like, I, I wrote it, it's kind of a beat sheet for it. And I would have, he guy meets a girl, you know, and they just spend a night together. And we could do this in one, a 
winner. You know, we could shoot. I think I'd recently seen Victoria, and I'd, I'd been really inspired by that. And, and I was like, let let me get to the to the truest form and just say, let's let's just go with them, you know, and and be there with them in every moment that they have, so that we don't we don't let the audience look away or escape. Let's be there in the awkwardness and in the moments and when they're falling in love with each other. So, so, so when I saw that trailer, actually, the thing that I was like, oh, this is really interesting to me because in a certain, it's like a, it's a mumblecore movie, right? It's like people <laughs> talking yeah. about their feelings and their dreams, yeah. right? But when you hear mumblecore, you think shaky cam and like right. no, low no, grade we, ca- camera right, and, and, right, and right. like, you know. Uh, uh, I, I said that immediately when I got yeah. my DP. I was like, I don't, I don't want it to look. It looks Chucky, like a, it looks like a JJ Abrams let's... movie. It's like <laughs> like lens flares, flares and yeah. like you know like yeah. high contrast anamorphic. lighting, anamorphic. Yeah, anamorphic. You know, yeah, super it's stylized. Super, it's yeah, it's colors. super fluid. You know, and like yeah, it's a one or so. Like coverage is limited, right? You're kind of like shifting to catch people and things like that. So it is like. But Matt didn't know it was a one or from the trailer, and the only reason I knew it was a one or is because our buddy Steph told me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I rewatched yeah, it. I was like, "Oh, yeah, yeah, totally." But it, it it imposes this style on it that's really cool. That's really it, like it refreshes all of those ideas and tropes and opportunities. I thought it was really cool. Really cool. I think there is some there's something fascinating about how filmmakers the the more experienced they become the the more they crave limitations. And the more the and the smaller stories they want to tell, because it's like more about like, you know, drilling down to a, a kernel of truth than it is building a giant right. world. And that's right? and that's you said it perfectly. I, I I was like, after going on this tour of meetings and having I don't there's something about people trying to determine what my career is gonna be, you know. There's a certain this this industry will will, will create a picture of you. They will, they will define you. I'm more interested in defining myself and saying, if I can do something, I'm going to go ahead and do it. I'm not going to wait another five years to make a movie. Because, and there was some of that insecurity there too. Like the amount of space and time was between Muslim and Destin. And I was just determined. I'm like, I'm not doing that again. And so what can I make? You know, I have an actor who's great, who, who, who wants to, to do something. And I, I called him up with the idea. Like, hey man, I'm thinking doing this we talked for hours and um and then there's a this guy this producer Datari turner who we had been talking as well and he was good friends with megan good and formed a company together and he's like yeah this this would be a great combo so we all talked and my wife and i wrote it and and you wrote it just like you would write a regular screenplay no no this was the screenplay was like 50 pages because you account for the time that it takes to move from place to place Um, did you do some tests to figure out oh yeah we i've I prepped on this thing more than any. I mean, this was like a moving play. It had to be because what is the movie going to, is it going to be 45 minutes or is it going to be two hours? Like you didn't know. You had to go and walk it, walk the route. You had to go and drive. Okay, they're going to go from this club to this house. How long is that drive going to take? What if a fire truck, you know, is stopped in the road? Where would they go? You know, what's it going to be like to have, Megan and Amari out in the streets in LA or people going to run up to try to get autographs. We got to have extra PAs because of that. Like just sort of standing around their, their extras, but like they're also playing offensive line. Like if somebody shows up, you get that twinkle in your eye. Do you want to go and hug Omari or Megan? They're going to stop you. And so logistically it was, it was, it was unbelievable. The amount of prep that went into it. Just to ask about that. You want to make this movie that has scope, but is a one and it's personal, but also feels big, right, feels right, like a movie. Right. How do you like say like, okay, let's limit this to five locations. Let's have two car rides. Let's have right. two walks. You, gotta like, limit you, start, it. you have to limit it. How do you break that down? You just assume, and after testing, like all right, how many places can, can we really go? I don't want it to be just them in a room. You know, I, I don't think that would be interesting. And I think LA is a character in this. So how do we, how do we show LA too? Um, well, the house they go to has to be in the hills. It has to overlook. It can't be a house right there in Beverly Hills or something where you can't really see a view. You know, it's it doesn't make sense to me. We have to have a house up here. Right, where you see the city. Because that's part of the dream, you know. Um, 
when they go up the hill and they finally look over and they're like, oh man, this is, you know, and, and there has to be an outdoor space to the house that has, um, that has something to it as well. You know, what's the first to, location in the movie? Is it the house? It's no, it's, it's exterior of the Pacific center. Yeah. The Pacific center. Yes. So it's, it's in front of there and there's a food truck out of there outside of there. And they're, they're sort of waiting as club promoters are waiting for these other girls to show up so they can walk up to the club and, and Megan's sitting there eating food. And it's and nighttime. Food truck. Yeah. It's night. Nighttime. And so how and, do you and light so, it? So we pre-lit everything. Um, so, on the light poles, there's lights up there, and everything was high because we're we're going everywhere. We're 360. We had lights that we used on the food truck that looked like regular food truck lights, but when the actors walked into it, it lit them in a in a certain way. Um, we had lights uh, on all of the street on the street lights around. We cho- I t- specifically chose a block that was well lit at night. Um, and this, you have permits this, and everything, right? This is like mm, a legit yeah, yeah. thing. Yeah. So, so as they're walking up to the club, there are all these lights coming from these stores that were beautiful. And so, do you have to get permission from all these stores to use their their storefronts and stuff? Well, yes, yes, we did. So we lit inside the club pre. We lit the house. We had we rented the house for you know a week or whatever, and so we had it. And you know, everyone's each day of shooting, everyone was up there waiting while people were in the club. I mean, it was like, it was crazy. It was unbelievable. How many extras do you have? I mean, hundreds. Because we had all these people in the club. There were all these people outside. There were, there was probably 30 people in the house. Plus crew. Yeah. And are so, you on a steady cam the whole time? There was a rig that was built specifically for this. It like went around his waist and all. It was, it's, I know steady cam does that as well, but it wasn't a specifically a steady cam. It was a rig. And that, what camera? That Steve Holler built just for this. The Sony A7S II. Oh, really? Damn. With this crazy, this crazy anamorphic you, lens. You on are. It. You said the oh, exact man. right thing. Like, look at Oren's face. Look how excited yeah, he I is. See. <laughs> well, I see. You know what I just bought? <laughs> A7S III. Nice, nice. Yeah. He's like so excited. Yeah, I mean, just for the way, for the size of it, mm-hmm. for the way it shoots in, in low at light. light. Yeah, they, yeah. Oh yeah, the know, low, light low light stuff is yeah. insane, right? It's brighter yeah. than what your eyes see. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Can I ask? Did you hide cuts? Were you like uh, over the course of these there's days? A couple, yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's Don't a tell couple. Anybody, though. Yeah, sure, 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 sure. But you know, let's just not bring that up. A couple thousand. And so, so for the budget now you're. You're, you've gone down from your previous films, mm-hmm. even though it sounds like just as expensive a production. It, 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 hundreds yeah, of extras. I know. I know. You're, is it SAG? It's SAG. I'm assuming. Obviously, you have these right, stars. Right. Right. So, so even that. I mean, it, but it was. I mean, it just the days, though. You know, you know, instead of 25, 24 days, you have three. You know. And how many <laughs> days of rehearsal are you doing with the actors? Well, we didn't use the extras for rehearsal. It was just no, but that your your main, your main cast. Um, I don't, we've, we rehearsed probably five, six days, but Did even you have before to, that, there, there's no cut. So they have to do it right. perfect. They have to do everything. I have to know all of the lines. So before that though, me and DP, we, we were daily, I mean, for months, just figuring it all out. Out there with like a phone or, or I mean, with a A7S, yes. you could just actually, have we had, we had the A7S, yeah. we had a phone. I would record like the route on myself. Once we got the house, we were just all through there. And I mean, any anywhere we went, I would make videos and, sh- and send them to the actors. Like, here's where you're going to be walking. So by the time they showed up, so at the time, Omari was still shooting Power, you know, and so the, the TV show with stars. And so he he would, you know, I would send him images and, 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 and videos of what we were going to do. Did you ever consider doing it, setting it during the day or was it always a night? No, it was always at night. And then, you know, so then there's this question of like, there's this conversation of, hey, Megan, Omar, this is going to be different than, than other films. I'm not going to pull you to the side and, 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 and talk to you about your performance, the, the, you know, what, what we can improve. We have to do this on, on, the, on the go. And it was a dance, you know, where, all right, that's just, just stay there and look at them like that. All right, now we got to go. We got to move. Um, okay, Omar, put it, you know, whatever. And so this is the car scene and when his van, I'm laying down in the back of the van with the monitor, you know, while they're sitting next to each other, you know, like that. You know, there's a scene where, where there's a cop, 
you know, it's interesting with the tragedy of George Floyd this summer, there's a scene where a cop like chokes Omari, you know, in the film. And after there's this fight where she's trying to protect her from these dudes who are harassing her. And, you know, when the move was, he goes over this, this fight begins, she comes up, she tries to help, they, he, they push her away. We go with her, she's like, stop it, somebody help, whatever. And there's these cops over there. While we're over here, the, there's a makeup guy and a hair person behind the, the, the building who come out and put like a blood pack in Omari's mouth and put a little blood around his nose and like give him a little red. Sure. It's like him. you're and shooting an SNL sketch all of behind, a sudden. Yeah, yeah. And then here she comes with, here the cops come like, hey, oh, you know, and while they got to and all that in post, you know, you that was the biggest job of sound. One of them was just like trying to get my voice the hell out of there. It was everywhere. <laughs> I mean, it's everywhere. Yeah. And I'm uh, sure there's some just, VFX yeah. cleaning up some, uh, Errant crew members, and yeah, stuff, crew members, right? lights, moving, all that moving stuff. a microphone, yeah, or a yeah walkie for sure. There was a lot of there was a lot of repositioning of the frame. I mean, we we had to shoot 4K because it was the frame was constantly. There was a light here, there was a boom yeah, here, yeah, yeah. Just, little yeah. stabilization. It too. was a mess. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it was just everywhere stuff. Cool. And where uh, where did that movie premiere? <laughs> Sundance. Yeah. Um, how so fine so then so i'm i edited i mean it was all of that all of that work i ended up doing you know most of it, the post work of repositioning and yeah you're like i'll it. i'll edit this guys i got it <laughs> right right no cuts and so mind you there were like 20 something minute takes i mean it was like one take it was 28 minutes you know this was what we were doing so then we you know uh we got a cut together and we sent it in to sundance and a couple months later i'm back here and i'm, I'm I missed the call and I go out and there's a message and, and it's like, hey, this is Charlie Freelo from Sundance Institute. I'm like, oh shit, we got in. Yeah. Cause you know, like, like everyone's like getting in. those calls like right around Thanksgiving, basically. Yeah. Like, you know, it's Sundance season basically. Yeah. 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 It was probably two weeks before Thanksgiving um, and I took a knee and I cried again. <laughs> I mean, it was one of the greatest moments, you know, of my career. it just, and so I, <sighs> First told my wife and then I told the producer and the DP. And then we went on to get the version that we were gonna play. And and then we went there. And you, you, you go you go there and you're like, Well, first you get the, the they you're not supposed to say anything for weeks and this is like the hardest thing to do. Or maybe a month. And it's they like when the I want Jeopardy out. and they're like, Don't tell him. Right, right. The announcement comes out and, and you're looking at all these other movies and you're like, Whoa, you know, everyone else has ten producers, you know, <laughs> every Every other movie has, and you're, you're, these are people you know, and you're, you're just like, oh. So not only you get in, now you got to like make a scene there. You got to be there. You can't just go. There's there's getting in the center, and then there's making your presence known. And the film is one part of it, but then you got to have a party. You got to have PR people, and you got to, because for days you're being whisked, whisked around to interviews and all kinds of things. You don't want to miss stuff. You want to be everywhere. And you want people to know. And our film premiered and it got great reception and a standing O and all this. And it just was one of the most ex and exceptional moments of my life. And I stood in front of this audience of almost a thousand, I mean, it must have been 700 people or something. And, you know, and I You're said, like, I should have charged each of you 20 bucks. <laughs> yes, way to bring that one back around. <laughs> Sundance did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah they did. Um, and uh, and so then we then that day we had a couple offers and we eventually went with Samuel Goldwyn who picked up the film. So from there it was it was you know playing out the rest of Sundance. And I went to all five screenings and had Q and A's and all that. It was just great experience. And and then I came back to LA and. I ended up changing agents. I went to ICM after that. And, you know, man, I, I've jumped around to different managers and stuff. And it's just, it was, it was just a, it was a whole thing in itself, but mostly like just trying to make sure that I stayed true to what I was doing. And it never became like, cause I'm still going through this sort of, I'm up for things and I may not get it and may get something else. I got a TV show that was picked up by a major network that you that are I created, directing or that you created that I created. Oh, cool. um, and that's, but I can't, I can't say, 
you know, I can't talk about it, you know, so there's stuff like that. But is it, yeah. uh, are you going to shoot the whole season or you're going to shoot a pilot or what's, the, um, we'll what see, stage we'll are see. You COVID has slowed things down a bit, but we'll see. And then I, I, I got this. And for that you get paid, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You get paid to write a, a pilot of your story. It's just unbelievable. It's the, it's so, so is that your, your WGA now for that? Mm, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's like, we're in the process right now. That's why say it like that but yeah i mean and then you know from there I, i've been writing my ass off i've just been writing you know because i haven't been able to shoot um this was going to be the year of shooting i was going to shoot this pilot and shoot this film and the film has gone away now it's it was a it was based on a novel that um that had been rewritten into a, a screenplay by george pelicanos and dennis lehane and richard price these are the people who made like the wire and um, Treme and some other things and they were looking for um, a director and I came in and, and rewrote I rewrote their script you know mm -hmm. um, you're like the wire's okay <laughs> <laughs> right hey guys I'm gonna come in and just yeah <laughs> and but but I had to be approved by them to do so that was in their deal like next, next writer I have, they have to be approved so I develop a relationship with these guys and it's you know, they approved me after seeing Boy Girl Dream and, and I rewrote the whole, I mean, I changed everything, you know, to, to focus solely on the, the, the star of the show of the, of the movie and, um, and to be his story more so, but that movie's good. It's gone now for me. So it's some legal stuff happened with COVID and the, the, the licensing ran out with the author and didn't want to renew. I don't know something, all this stuff, there's all this stuff that you just won't hear of. And, and meanwhile, that there's no announcement about that or anything. So that's that's not something that people really know about either. So, so that that was my 2020 or 2019 of rewriting that, writing my pilot, you know, rewriting the pilot several times. And the pilot, and you're just writing on spec, right? Like you have no. No, one. the pilot was at the network, the network where I was getting paid to write. Oh, you, so you pitched it to them? They said, "Yeah, pitch it now to we'll them. pay you to write it." Yeah, yeah. And how did you get? in that your reps got you a meeting yeah so them. so long story short when i was doing all my generals and stuff i met with someone at a network and i soft pitched this idea of a show and they're like oh that's pretty good do you want to come in and do a real pitch and i'm like Shit, what yeah You're of like, course of <laughs> course yeah and so yeah. i love so water. for the next like so then it kind of got messed up with where i was you know the team that i was with i'm not going to mention anyone because i don't like to talk about people like that because there's various things that happen, who knows why, but it, it kind of went away. Then I go to this premiere for one of their shows and I see that guy again, it's like a year later. And he's like, you never came back in. I'm like, oh my God, I thought you guys didn't want the show. He's like, no, we still want to hear it. Oh, are you kidding me? He's like, what have you been up to? I'm like, actually, I made another movie. I got into Sundance. He's like, oh shit, like, you know, because all this was yeah, happening sure. while I was trying to do the show. Right, right, and right. so he's like, oh, cool. So then I invite them to the premiere of the movie when we premiered at it's at dark light in hollywood and they're there so th so i have that going for me so they're seeing that and i'm pushing and that come in a couple months later and pitch the show and they're like all right let's do it so i mean there's that's the short version but you but this was over a course of two and a half three years you know yeah no of i mean meeting hear, them we hear going a away. Of this story all the time it's like that one person i like had coffee with eight years ago turns out they work at this place where i just had the meeting right you know it right. just it's right. about building. It's about a building a relationship network, but you know? but also then and still working through it. You know, they were like, "Oh yeah, we'd love to hear it," but then when you said, "Yeah, I made a movie in between the last time we saw each other, and it got right, to right. Sundance," they're like, yeah, "Oh, yeah. now I mean it. Now I really right. want you to so, come in." And I, and I really want to drive that home because that has happened in all of these situations. It wasn't just meeting Danny Glover. It was like, "Yeah, I won the competition, and I found an investor, and I, then Danny Glover got in it." You know, I didn't just get this show set up at this network. No, I made another movie. I got into Sundance. I like invited them to the premiere so they could kind of get that feeling of, you know what I mean? So like, right. No one that, component unlocks. There's everything. no one component. There's never one component. So even now in this moment of, of where I'm, what I'm doing now is, is that because I didn't shoot the pilot this year, because I didn't shoot that film that went away, it was like, all right, now I'm meeting about other things. I'm up for some things. But then I was like, 
I'm going to do what I know how to do for real. I'm going to write some stuff. You're going to and, I, and not only that, it. but I'm going to write some stuff with the business in mind. So I literally wrote a zombie movie and I wrote a comedy. And I'm like, you but know, they're but, like the Kasim versions of this. yes, yeah. It's 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 a zombie movie that you know. Talks There's no about. zombies in it. It's, it's 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 got a social heart to it you know it's got a social commentary to it you know it's like what if these communities that are historically left behind by the government when something horrible happens katrina oh, you know yeah, yeah sure. Flint, you know smart. what if yeah. something even worse happened like a zombie apocalypse sure. how would this how would they be treated right you know? and so that's a great pitch that's that's kind of the, the core of it and so which is interesting also that's kind of always been at the heart of zombie movies they just haven't really right. gotten to it right. quite so pointedly that's interesting right. that's great yeah. Well, awesome. awesome. Well, we can't yeah. wait to see Sign me up, man. what's next. I know we know there's a lot of things coming up and that's th- you have an awesome story. I feel like you could make kind of a, a little movie about well, that. Thanks. Like, thanks. Still, you, still uh, going. I'm still in the trying to convince the guy at the convenience store to sell your DVD <laughs> with the picture of you. Must see yeah. film of the year. That's a good yeah. cold uh, open. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it ends with you at Sundance yeah. crying. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah awesome. That's good. Do you, that's uh, good. We got to start the next movie. Can you please leave the theater? Yeah. Um, Someone else's dreams are about to be realized. So, right, yeah, you know, right. it's, a, it's not just a boy, a girl and dream. Uh, one dream. We got a bunch of them. Um, well, cool. Are you down to hang out and endorse something real quick? Unpaid endorsements. Yeah. Small acts, man. You know. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. Ooh. And is yeah, there a specific episode of Small Acts? That, the first one. Is it that just... Mangrove? It just had me. I mean, I, I'm still behind, so I got to watch more. But so, Small Axe is a Steve McQueen show. It's a BBC BBC show. BBC, yeah, but it's on Amazon. Oh, Amazon Prime in the US. It's it just really hit me in the in the in a pretty significant space. You know, just after the summer of movements and marches, like we haven't seen ever in this country. It's it, this summer was even bigger than so, civil rights. Um, but Small Axe takes place in like the 1600s. What? No, or it's 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 a six, 1970s in, oh, in it is? in London. Like the well, West that, that episode. community. That episode. Yeah, I yeah. think each is almost like its own each, little Each is own it's its own movie. Yeah, yeah. He just got to make so, six movies basically. So that that is yeah. that was powerful, man, especially the way it, where it goes, how it ends. I just really was moved by that and inspired, you know, he's a masterful filmmaker, so yeah so good that's that's what i'm bringing to my next stuff is mastery man you know this next time around it's like all right let's go yeah that's yeah you just go from the sony a7s2 to sony a7s3 <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um cool matt you got anything yeah i got a dumb one um i there's a a, a twitter account uh, by a guy named nick lutzko who uh he's like a musician he writes like kind of like parody like not even parody just kind of like goofy songs basically that uh have really cheered me up they're quite bizarre and strange with a like a political bent um and kind of like a weird running storyline through all of them where he lives with his grandma and maybe jeff bezos murdered her and um but the the political uh bent is is the thing that's the funniest and the most pointed and he kind of went viral with a song called i want to be at the rnc where he says he wants to hang out with Dan Bongino and it's just like very catchy and strange and in your face and there's one about Don Jr. wanting to hunt Hunter Biden that's just bizarre and strange but like I said like very pointed politically in a way that's like absurdist and really fun so you know uh as a what's his name Nick Lutzko is his name L U T S S K O. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's weird stuff, stuff for sure. But I, as a fan of novelty music, it's um right up my alley. I especially like the Don Junior one. Is like very strange. Uh, Oren, what you got, buddy? Well, to be totally honest, I don't have like a thing in mind, but something that I have been doing kind of recently. It's more of a commercial short type thing, I guess. Is um, when people ask me for work samples. I started doing this about a year ago, and I I think it's good a good thing to do, which is I'll send them like, you know, commercials that are like 30 seconds or 60 seconds. So it's, I'll send like five or six, but I'll put like a tiny little note just in parentheses after the link of why I'm sending that. Like why I think this sample right, I'm sending you applies right. to your project. Like I'm That's sending you this because it's grounded comedy or it's like um, 
kind of super wide angle shots mm-hmm. of locations. Or Great like car a, work here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I think it, it makes people, instead of making people sit through things, like now they have something to like look for in in the work that I'm sending them. So I feel like it's, and it also, it just lets me set it up like, hey, by the way, here's here's some recent work um, and the reason I'm sending it to you, you know. Tell and them so, why they like it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, because, you know, when you're pitching, it's always so hard to use references and say like, but it's like this character from this show and in this setting from this movie and. Uh, mm-hmm. But with this and, visual style, yeah, it's like and hard so for I people. Think, yeah. yeah, when sending even commercial work, it's worth mentioning. Um, basically, like whenever you're trying to to steal a few minutes of someone's t- life, <laughs> you know, give them the reason why. Reason why. Yep. Yeah, because yeah. when, you know, was having a podcast, a lot of people send us like 25 minute shorts and they're like, can you watch this and let, let us know what you think? And yeah, I, I try to watch stuff when I can, but it's like a lot of time to invest and not know like exactly what you want from me, you know, why you're sending this to me. So yeah, just, just a tip that's been working for me recently. Who knows? I might change my mind next year. Um, but cool. Well, thanks, dude. Thanks so much. Do you, do you have a website or anything? Yeah. How can, can, how can listeners yeah, I'm, I'm, just, I'm not, I don't, not yet. I'm working on that. I, I'm just on social media. I'm, I'll get back on after, after I finish these drafts these new drafts these scripts but probably next year but I'm at Qasim A. Basir Q-A-S-I-M A-B-A-S-I-R on Twitter and Instagram yeah and just Facebook. Google his name and check out your director's reel is awesome and uh, oh, thanks, all your movies thanks. obviously A Boy A Girl A Dream Destined Muslim M-O-O-Z dash L-U-M right yeah, yeah. Spell? Um, yeah and uh, cool. And you can find out more about everything we talked about at justshootapod.com. We're going to put notes and links to all of Cossum's stuff there. Um, you can email us at justshootapod at gmail.com. You can find me. I'm on Twitter at smiteypileg, S-M-I-T-E-Y-P-I-E-L-E-G. I don't know why. Uh, I'm on everything else at O Kaplan. Uh, you can find everything about our show at Just Shoot It Pod. And you can find me at Mr. Matt Enlo. This episode was edited by Sarah Weirda. Our social media manager is Derek Aiello. Our webmaster is Ewan Williams. And I think that's everything. That's all she wrote. And we'll catch you next time. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.